Um, right. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you, uh, Will, for that. You know, pretty succinct introduction. Um, are we are we mic'd up and working? Can everyone hear us? Can you hear Bob? Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, we're McCloy Muchemwa, and uh, this is Steve Dambo. You might know me. You might have met me already. Uh, I teach here uh, first years. Uh, I also teach at the Bartlett Technology second year. Uh, and Steve? Yeah, um, I'm a practicing architect in London. I mean, Bo also practices. And we're kind of old friends from uni. We actually met in undergraduate in Leeds. And then, uh, as Will mentioned, uh, Bo came to Westminster to study part two. I went to the Bartlett. And we kind of always remained friends. We actually were flatmates yeah. uh, during our time in London uh, studying. And we just kept up a, like a conversation going. And we started realizing, once we'd gone into the world of work, that we wanted to keep uh, experimenting with architecture, Yeah, I, I guess. Th I think what, what, what normally happens is that when you're finished with your education, uh, your portfolio sort of kind of gets put under the drawer somewhere. We, we just kind of wanted to continue with the sort of kind of experimentation and, and sort of kind of the fun that we had at Westminster and the fun that we had back in Leeds when we first met. So the, 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 the compilation here is of little projects uh, of people that are just sort of kind of starting. Um, they're, they're not perfect projects. They're not uh, accomplished, but they're sort of kind of at the starting point. And in a way, uh, it, it's great because then you get to see where things sort of start out. Because sometimes you get sort of talks from mature practices, and you, you wonder where, where they were their first doorknob, uh, if they ever designed one, what it looked like. So maybe this could be uh, helpful for anyone who's interested in starting a practice one day. Yeah. And it's worth saying that we, we don't have any staff. We've never uh, employed anyone. So all, all the work, more or less, we're going to show tonight has been done by us, all the renders, all the sketches, all the physical models. But we do collaborate with lots of other people, and I think we'll try and mention them if possible. OK, shall I start, Bob? Yeah. OK, so the, one of the big challenges, is that big enough text for you? <laughs> <laughs> one, of the big, one of the big challenges of when you're starting out is your, your guidance of your tutor is kind of gone. You don't, you know, you, it's up to now you to define what your work is going to be about, what, your, what briefs you're going to choose to tackle, uh, and how you're going to tackle them, and what your time scale is going to be. So we call this also situating, which means within all the different types of architecture that you can make, how do we find, how do we kind of situate our practice within it? Recently, we were super lucky to have been included in the Architects Journal 40 Under 40. There's quite a few names in that list which are pretty well known and they've done lots of work, like for example, Assemble or Studio Weave or Office s and But you know, we find our own place in there somehow. And it's also a map, you know, you find yourself like kind of like, where's Wally? But it's also a map of different types of work. And I think that's what we're really experimenting with. Yeah. Because uh, if we're going to have a practice one day, we, we sort of want to know how to work together. We, we want to find out through experimentation what our agenda is, um, who our collaborators are going to be, and what, you know, what type of architect we really want to be, rather than just doing the first job that lands on your table. We've also been you know, included in some other surveys, including um, New Architects 4, which is quite an interesting book of emerging practices showing a diversity of approaches. These diagrams are kind of some traditional ways of looking at uh, architectural styles over the, over the, say, the 20th century. You know, noticing that certain individuals, the Norman Fosters, Renzo Piano, Future Systems, they all live in one group of theory and practice, and they're all friends. And then somewhere else, there's other people who's a group of friends. But they can situate themselves within that. But this is a kind of a more up-to-date one, up-to-date version, um, the taxonomy of emerging architecture, and it's got relevant themes to the kind of work 
that you may, might be doing as an emerging practitioner. So, you know, one popular style is austerity chic, which we kind of identify with a lot because our projects tend to be extremely low budget or rather we have to be very creative with the budget that we get in order to maximize our kind of design input. Well, I, I think we, we set up the practice in a way to um, continue our experiments that we, we were doing when we were students just like you. And we thought actually starting a practice uh, with competitions is a good way of start, you know, to start to sort of experiment with uh, identifying what kind of work you want to do. Uh, th this is a project that uh, we won in 2017. Uh, it, it was a, a, a bench uh, in, in sort of centre of London, and uh, we wanted to make essentially uh, something that folds and sort of kind of then uh, you can occupy, and it, within its fold you can sort of find your own space. And, but it, in a way, it sort of kind of un, un, unfolds and sort of goes on forever. Uh, we did this drawing after we built the, the, the bench for uh, our exhibition in Beijing. Uh, we, we thought, you know, it could be something that can sort of uh, go on for, for, for on and on and on. And people can sort of find little uh, uh, nooks and crannies uh, where they can sort of occupy. Uh, within that, we're, we're not only thinking about concept, but we're thinking about how you're going to build these things. Uh, the idea of uh, how you're going to build these things are normally just through discussing with, with each other. Uh, and then uh, we, we got sort of kind of the, the lack of actually building it ourselves in our backyard. Uh, and then there's Steve enjoying the sort of different sort of positions and different um, folds that you can sort of uh, find yourself in. And we then sort of kind of uh, spied on people uh, for, for, for a number of weeks, just looking at what people do with a, with a sort of a random object in a mall and how they, um, they, they can start occupying the space and interacting with the space. We found that fascinating. And, you know, we, make, we made notes and sort of find, uh, found out how, you know, uh, once you put an object in a space, people start occupying it. and uh, the idea of um, in interaction with objects became uh, sort of a fascination. Uh, a, the, the other one is uh, about almost similar idea of uh, imagining how people are going to use an object. This is another bench uh, on the following here. There'll be a few, a few there's been a few benches. <laughs> um, so th this is this is one bench we did the following year after the the, the big yellow one uh, we called it the uh, the boys are back in town. These are sort of standard issue sort of boys that you find uh, in the sort of shipping business, and um, the the bench was going to be situated near the, the docks, and we thought it would be fascinating to sort of juxtapose the idea, flipping the perception of what you can do with the. With a, uh, with a sort of mundane object and make it something that jolts your, your imagination when you're sort of walking past it. And we sort of uh, do this drawing to sort of think about people. I think sometimes people in architecture or maybe architects and what they design uh, normally don't have people in it, but we're obsessed with sort of thinking about how people are going to occupy a thing, an object, a space, um, and this is one experiment that we, we are, we're yet to do. We're going to uh, start floating this bench uh, in, the, in the docks at some point. We'll wait for it to be really cold and then do it, won't we? Yeah. knowing our luck. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then we, we, we just imagine that you could have you know, various colors and information of these. And again, you know, looking at how you make these things, you know, through just making sketches, testing out, you know, also just kind of having fun with it. Uh, in a way, it's about experimenting. And, you know, uh, this is the making, making of the, the thing. And we had a local celeb to open the, uh, the bench when it was built. 
that's big grease over there. Um, the grime wrapper, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple enjoying the, uh, the bench when we built it. And that image of the sort of the boys on the water and the sort of fluorescent thing, uh, I think it's sort of, I don't know, I think that this image is quite cinematic, really. Uh, and I like it. Uh, and there's an interesting quality to it. Um, it's sort of fluorescent in the dark. And um, yeah. And this is a quite a popular image. Uh, this is actually an image that we, we stole from Frank Gehry. He had designed a chair. Now it was a, it was a table and I sort of kind of leaped from it. And we thought actually this should be like our practice image. Yeah, pay, of, paying homage to Frank Gehry. Yeah, uh, of two people just having fun with architecture. Okay, so Bo mentioned flipping of perceptions. That became, I think for us, we, you, you haven't got a lot of money. You have to think, again, the, 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 we, we don't say think outside the box. We think, always think of flipping people's perceptions of things. And we were, we were lucky to get an opportunity to work with a company to develop a, a new type of bicycle frame. And they, you know, they were suggesting, can you do it in bamboo? Which we thought was amazing because timber is uh, extremely a low embodied carbon material compared to the, the aluminum, steel, or carbon fiber of a regular bicycle frame. Is that, and the, the frame of a bicycle is actually the easiest part of the bicycle that you can uh, reduce your carbon footprint on, technically. So it was, a, it was a very, very exciting idea, but there was quite a lot of technical challenges to it. We were looking across the catalog. People have already done sort of mountain bike and city bikes in bamboo. We also wanted to think of a sort of a, in a way, new type of bicycle, like the references of Brompton. And it's, actually, it's uh, and also references this bicycle uh, called Molten. And this, this would be like a city bike, um, like a fast but small, small wheel bicycle, which would hold your kind of architecture A3 portfolio, because we knew that one of the clients in the, in the end would be us. <laughs> So we worked all, out all the technical things. The, the bicycle frame is made of, of bamboo and uh, a biocomposite resin and flax fiber construction. So it's, the whole thing is plant-based and you know, kind of ultimately biodegradable. These are some of the kind of early sketches. We then went through the process of building prototype number one ourselves in a workshop and kind of selecting the bamboo. The, Kind of a key design feature is two parallel top bars, which will eventually hold the portfolio. And you know the the biocomposite wrap, which is a bit like if you break your arm, you wrap it. You know we kind of just picked it out in white, so to let the bamboo be the aesthetically the number one uh, feature of the bicycle, which is that flip of perceptions that that you know grass or timber could be a bicycle. This is the kind of final thing with the A3 portfolio which I use regularly. Yeah, some kind of details. The ends of the bamboo stalks can be hollowed out. We put in some uh, recessed LED lights. It's kind of the overall thing. Yeah, and the bike is available as a, a kit that you can build yourself, which we thought was interesting because we learned a lot from the from actually manufacturing, the, or like building the first prototype. It was a very interesting um, experience and kind of getting to know about materials and getting to understand what it, what it takes to produce kind of plant-based products. Another theme that we have is, is called loose boundaries, which I suppose for us is, is uh, in opposition to what we found a lot in practice, which is you end up doing a lot of square buildings with very fixed rules. Um, and we like to break from fixed rules and we try to uh, make things as public as possible or kind of break down barriers or boundaries. So this project is for Chelsea Football Club. And I think probably about 2015 or 2014, 
Chelsea announced that they were going to have a redevelopment of their stadium, and they'd appointed Hazog de Maron to produce the design. And as part of the design, there was a requirement for two new large pedestrian access bridges. This one is off Stamford Bridge, and this one is from the station. And those bridges would have to be closed off with a pair of new iconic gates. So these, it's just some historical image of the gates at Stamford Bridge. And you can see that really not super imaginative, but there's, it's all about the anticipation of entering the stadium. We kind of wanted instead to uh, heighten the, the sense of arrival and the kind of also the brand of Chelsea. To, ar to arrive at Chelsea would, would have to be really super special. And we, we referenced paintings by Lowry, which were just packed with people, packed with kind of energy to visit the football match. Some of Bo's first sketchbook pages, just loads of people and then some traces of uh, gates in the background that you can't really see. That's what we wanted. Then we thought, how could this have some different kinds of relationships? How could we not just have a gate be a two-dimensional uh, barrier that opens and closes, but actually form a public space in which lots of people could uh, be involved in? And we were thinking about mirrors or these kind of large plates that like, start to segment the space. some kind of concept images about color and texture. We started making models of these pillars which had these fold-out uh, mirrored panel gate walls. And this, these would be kind of like monoliths that would uh, then sort of assemble like a football team formation. You would have to pass through these giant seven-meter pillars into the stadium. The kind of doors fold out like this and they can link together in a variety of ways. So there's, there's kind of open formation on match day, everyone can walk through, no problem. On a non-match day when the gate is closed, there's still that exciting public place where people can go and do selfies and just, you know, go, people, people always visiting um, Stamford Bridge just so, for the experience. Is that a 4-4-2 four, four, formation or 4-5-3? Four, four, <laughs> not quite sure. What, what do Chelsea play nowadays? I think we did it in 4-4-2, four, four, yeah. but forgive us, yeah. Yeah, and it would allow other things like emergency vehicles and pedestrian flows, certain things to happen. There's our installation relative to the stadium design. And then when we drew it, we tried to make it like trying to heighten the atmosphere. We'd have these uh, blue lights shining up into the sky, which references uh, UEFA Champions League advert. And this is kind of the favorite drawing where you can see the mirrored panels, you know, trying to heighten the excitement of the home fans entering the stadium there. Uh, and the, the other sort of themes that we've been experimenting with this, uh, this idea of in-between spaces. I think that Chelsea thing has a sort of uh, a similar sort of uh, ideas. Um, th this is a recent competition that we uh, got shortlisted in. I think we kind of finished second. We kind of narrow miss, narrowly missed uh, winning it. Um, very painful. <laughs> um, but the people that won our uh, our friends, so it's fine. Uh, this is uh, this was a competition uh, for the. Uh, if you ever seen uh, Doctor Who, uh, the the TARDIS, uh, which is sort of the um, the box that they uh, the police used to use back in the 70s, uh, uh, and even before that, uh, uh, essentially at the beginning where the telephone was invented in a way that this was a sort of um, a substation uh, when you wanted to sort of increase the police presence uh, you'd have smaller little stations with the telephone boxes and uh, the police wanted a new box essentially uh, something that's more of a 
uh, references, uh, the new technologies, uh, uh, sort of the internet, um, um, artificial intelligence. Uh, they're also thinking about um, how they can make it green, but also in a way, moving away from the idea of police presence, but at the sense, but uh, towards something that they call um, police uh, public engagement, where the police is, you know, presents a much more uh, friendlier face and also something that's more uh, approachable. Uh, but it, it's not essentially about sort of solving crimes, but sort of kind of uh, increasing um, the, the, the notion of having uh, being safe. Uh, we collected a bunch of really an amazing uh, group of people from Arabs, from UCL, from uh, a, a, an amazing garden designer uh, uh, to make this idea. Um, this idea sort of kind of came up from uh, walking around and seeing that police uh, usually uh, come in pairs, there are two bobbies on the bit. And we thought actually the idea of having uh, this police box being segmented into two makes it so that there's this in-between space that then becomes a way of interacting and forming a sort of amphitheater of some sort. You know, the, the in-between becomes a place where you can have this sort of public engagement. Uh, uh, currently, they, they use tents and uh, you know, the, the sort of information centers, they're quite simple and quite crude. And in a way, we, we, we looked into that and said actually what, what you could do is kind of have more of the same, but sort of more organized and, and sort of much nicer and more sort of has a sort of presence and, and, and sort of symbolizes what the police is all about. Um, you could then look at what these pair uh, do uh, in different sort of uh, conditions. Uh, and are they also the fascinating thing about London is that it, a lot of it is built out of Portland stone since the sort of Great Fire. Um, so we, we thought actually something that symbolizes sort of the center of London is this sort of white uh, Portland stone. And that we thought we should definitely use it. But the, the, the interesting thing is that our, our engineer from Arab came back to us and said, you know, we, we've been doing this in, um, in Spain. Uh, this is Sangranda Familia. Uh, and then the nice thing about it is that you could, uh, you know, you, you can be made uh, off-site and, you know, with connections. And it, it's sort of like a, um, a sort of a simpler build from the sort of ancient ways of where you're sort of lifting uh, you've, you're cutting and sort of lifting. Yeah, a key, a key thing about this was that the post-tensioned natural stone can be uh, constructed without fixings, uh, without, without kind of mortars, and it can also be much more lightweight than conventional stone construction, make, uh, reducing the embodied uh, whole life carbon as well. That was a big consideration, wasn't it? Yeah, that was one of the big considerations. And then we, we went around London looking at what street furniture looks like, and, and all, all of it had this sort of uh, interesting motifs that they had a little hat on top of it. And we, we thought actually that would be interesting uh, to sort of uh, include it in our design. So in a way, we're, we're not sort of veering off from the traditions of what sort of London street furniture looks like. And then uh, the, essentially uh, the, uh, the process was sort of starting with the TARDIS and saying if we put a hat on it, could it be a canopy? Um, and then we made all these models and sort of experimenting 3D printing and, uh, and, and then it, it essentially uh, this, this idea of, um, you know, the, the, these two uh, coppers on the bit uh, became a, a sort of, we were convinced about the, the, the uh, validity of it. And as, as usual, we go through uh, sketchbook after sketchbook of thinking about how the thing is going to be built, uh, how we are thinking about how people are going to in, uh, interact with it. Uh, I think this probably one of, one of the most interesting sort of projects we've ever sort of 
worked on. And, uh, the, and there is a, where it's sort of situated next to St. Paul's and sort of referencing that um, uh, Portland stone and, and the sort of uh, idea of, of that actually it could be something of this century, but it, it can, uh, in a way, find itself in sort of historic London. Uh, this is sort of a scenario where the police are sort of doing their demonstrations about how people should lock their bikes. Uh, a night view, and you know, uh, there's, uh, we, we worked with Arabs and they had uh, a whole sort of interesting ideas about artificial intelligence and about how uh, you know, the police could start doing uh, different kinds of uh, policing with technology and how this could be augmented with that kind of technology. Uh, and inside, the brief was very crude. They just wanted uh, a desk for two uh, police people. Uh, and, 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 you know, emergency kit, uh, space for a laptop. Uh, you couldn't sit down because they make sure that they, you know, the police don't, don't sort of kind of hide in there and not do their jobs. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's a bit crude in there, but it's interesting to have a brief like that. Some elevations. Uh, small innovations, uh, and this is the idea. How how then do you uh, build this thing? And then you know we we, we had discussions with Arab about uh, essentially sort of off-site construction and how you almost like Lego you join these things together uh, without mortar or anything. And in a, in a way, at the end, uh, you 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 then just dismantle it without the sort of need of demolishing. Uh, anything. Uh, and then more discussions with Arab about, you know, the, the sort of weird cantilever that we were proposing. And we had, you know, more, more of those kind of calculations. And, and then we, we, we were working with the, uh, the garden designer. Um, I think we were interested in, in, in those colors, the reds and the blues, and sort of the yellows sort of, you know, another sort of hint of what the police sort of emblem is about, uh, and essentially just referencing it back into like the planting that we we're gonna have on the roof. Um, in a way, we we're thinking about the people that are going to be viewing it uh, from above, not just from the sideways or on the street. And this is a night view. Uh, if someone is looking, wayfinding at, at night, I don't know. Right, yeah. Um, so that was, that was about in-between spaces, wasn't it? But, yeah. But that, yeah, that's what a competition we're pretty proud of, the police station. Um, much earlier, but this is kind of a bigger project. If you notice, the project is kind of getting bigger and bigger as we go through. This was kind of one of our first buildings, like a kind of a bigger building, which we did for university, um, Leeds Beckett University. And it was a building where they wanted to unify the landscape architecture department and another group which was into materials research. And they said, oh, well, they can share the same new building or refurbished building. And we thought, oh, that's quite interesting because there's a lot of opportunities for, for those two disciplines to talk to each other, materials and sustainability research, talking to uh, essentially the built environment department, landscape. Elise Beckett's got one of these kind of Harvard looking formal uh, campuses, which is kind of cool. I guess you guys don't have that. But in the, co in the corner they've got, um, <laughs> over here in the corner they've got some sort of disused sheds and kind of loads of derelict sort of landscape here, but then also that's also set in a a wonderful forest, which I guess also Westminster doesn't have. <laughs> Although uh, you have that, that. We've got the tube of Have you got the farm or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you've got London. Yeah. Which is this, yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah, so the, the site is this, in this kind of crunchy old bit of landscape here. And with those two institutions, there was primary and secondary functions. And we were really interested in the in-between spaces and how we could, uh, Think of new interactions between people, 
you know, chance encounters or things you weren't expecting, or you might find a, a little private space or whatever, you know, just by jumbling everything. So essentially, we just jumbled it at first, and then we went into rigorous shuffling to kind of slightly unjumble it, but not too much unjumbling. We were thinking, because it's the landscape department, you know, it might be like, you know, walking in like an informal garden, so there would be these kind of big plant pots, we kind of imagined it conceptually, and then your, your little desks and offices were just like a little model within some plant pots. These were some of the competition drawings, where you can see some of the plan has got a bit more rationalized. There was two existing buildings which are completely stripped of their cladding, but their, uh, their structural frame is maintained, repaired, and then brought back to life as semi-outdoor spaces. Then a new, a new kind of greenhouse uh, would contain the, some, some of the new kind of key learning labs. But that, that greenhouse would also be kind of an environmental barrier so that it can heat up from the sunlight, but it's not, it doesn't have the energy demands or some of the other kind of architectural demands of like a enclosed building. So, you know, there's like a different layers to the, the thermal properties of the thing. So all the collaboration and kind of chance meetings would happen inside this greenhouse, which kind of looks a bit like that. So very simple, we imagined a very simple architecture for the new build elements. These kind of interior boxes are plant pots. We were proposing to, you know, use a lot of reclaimed bricks and materials. Kind of uh, our hero for this is Wang Shu, the Chinese architect. But yeah, like getting loads of texture, finding stuff on the site, and kind of building it back, just to show, just demonstrate kind of creative reuse and how exciting it can be. These are some of the kind of renders that came after, but we liked the quality of the, the drawings, which we did first a lot. And when we rendered it and put in the computer people, it kind of looked a bit cold. So we we, this is one of the first projects where we started mixing uh, renders with hand, little hand sketch people, just to, you can be more specific about what they're doing. It takes you, you know, 20 minutes on the internet to find a, you know, someone pushing a wheelbarrow in the right angle. Whereas, uh, you know, if you draw it, you can just get it exactly as you want. And it's got kind of a bit of humor and character to it, which is something that we're really into. We pick out, well, our architecture is very simple in this case, because it's a low budget scheme. But we pick out key things like, if we're gonna use a color, we're gonna use one color really well. So, you know, in this case, the, all the elements that are key metal work, like the expensive sliding door, the staircase, are in this yellow paint. And then these kind of very fancy chairs, which are from Japan, we also got in yellow. And I think one of the interesting things that we found out about using color and, and just one color is that if you're working on a really low budget project, having just sort of color for junctions, it sort of hides how awful your junctions are. So that's a trick that we found out. So that's why everything kind of looks like this. It's cheapness, not because we're just, it's all about styles, but how sort of cheap we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another kind of view from the back. Yeah, I was, I was saying, like, we're really interested in uh, developing our work from uni. And I think the, the drawing styles that we do are not, is not the same as the drawing styles that we had when we were both students. I think that's fair to say that we kind of mixed our interests together, but also we have sort of a quite an efficient style, I guess. Yeah, we draw it quite straight. We use pens and tracing paper. But for us, you know, the act of drawing it and thinking of the inhabitation, maybe through comics, has been, it's not just a way to draw the design at the end of the process. It's not like I'm just gonna have my project finished and then draw it. We're actually using drawing as a way to uh, enrich the entire process of design. So if we can imagine all the people of what they're doing, if we can think about lots of different processes as you go, then you get like a richer project at the end. But at the same time, I think uh, comics and drawings like that allow people to sort of enter the project. 
I think sometimes people get scared of reading plans or, you know, it, it, and at the same time, the other end of it is that if you show someone a, a, a render and if it doesn't turn up to be that same thing, you know, there's the sort of kind of disappointment. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's something in, in comics and drawings that sort of makes people uh, at least uh, stay in, in the form of discussion and actually just being creative. Yeah, and we use that for discussions with uh, our clients too. So this is a project that we did for Waltham Forest uh, Borough Council, um, a competition again, which was won by Studio Weave. We came third in this competition, but it was but to be on the shortlist for a young practice was quite a big deal for us. And we did the competition in the form of like a little children's book, but like comic, where we, we were just talking about all the things that. Uh, would benefit the community, how we were going to talk to the community uh, in terms of engagement, but how we we're also going to draw out kind of the appropriate qualities, right? Mm -hmm. So these are some of the these are some of the things that we said we were probably going to do. We were going to meet meet and explain proposals and who we were and how we, people could get in touch. We were going to have um, workshop events with experts ideas events with kids, we were going to collect, we were going to start a blog and a, and a post box so we could collect ideas and things, we were going to hold like exhibitions, galleries, blah, blah, blah. And then we also showed how those things could then inform the proposal so that there was a meaningful uh, local engagement with a variety of stakeholders throughout the process. These are probably some of the you know, little sketches from the book. And that's then translated into the architectural proposal, which is an extension to this library. We also refurbished the main building, but it's a, a timber library which has cafe and informal meeting spaces and a computer lab all in kind of one space. But again, you can kind of, you can see how the, the comic style follows through into the kind of the, the render. We're picking out some funny moments to, to remind people of, you know, important aspects of the scheme. You know, in, in this case, you know, uh, landscape and nature. In this case, it was about using the gardens for education and place to play, and you know, like a uh, diversity of audience, you know, multi generational, etc. And the uh, uh, ability to use the library beyond its hours with the new extension and to new, to new types of clients. So the, the cafe would attract new, new people into the library, but also things like outdoor cinema um, would kind of make it more relevant. Netflix and chill. <laughs> uh, um, How are we doing for time, Bob? I, th I think we're probably going to go off a little bit, but <laughs> bear with us. Uh, and the other um, uh, interesting one was uh, a fuzzy logic, and I think this is just a, a phrase that we mentioned in one of the meetings that we had uh, for, for this installation. Uh, the idea of fuzzy logic sort of kind of came from our just kind of talking to each other and also reading books. And I think one of the books was uh, by Soi Fujimoto about how uh, you could find sort of some order with, within chaos or things that sort of make no sense can actually kind of, you know, can make some sort of sense. So in, in that book, he's talking about how, you know, trees and caves are, are sort of the ideal um, uh, city and, and how they there's sort of juxtapose uh, between Tokyo, the chaos of Tokyo, and how Tokyo works, in, in, you know, with its own kind of chaos. But it's, you know, it's about sort of, Instead of trying to find order, uh, but in a way you're, you're, you're finding order in chaos. Yeah. These, are, these are images of birds flying, long, uh, long exposure photographs of birds in flight, as the book that Bo refers to. Uh, the, the, the drawings on the, is it my right? My right uh, are the, the drawings that we did for your competition uh, that 
we won. Uh, and that one, who did that? That's a, f a famous painting by Piet Mondrian. Piet Mondrian, yes. Uh, and so we were trying to, f to, to, to do that with the grid and then sort of jumble it until you find some sort of order. And, but at the same time, uh, our, our brief, uh, as usual, it had very like, little budget. And uh, our idea was then to sort of use these uh, uh, traffic cons, the barriers, uh, to actually build up an architecture uh, of something. Uh, I think you could hire these at 18p a day. So in a way, you could build up architecture that's temporary and sort of kind of rent it and um, send it off back to where it came from. Uh, in a way, we were thinking about how you could uh, 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 just sort of radically reduce the material you use because usually institutions like this have um, pavilions and sort of installations but at the end you wonder where all these things end up so that was our sort of main idea this is the site this is in Leeds and uh, you know just looking at are you aware and then just us experimenting with stacking these barriers together. And you know, we, we, we were talking with the contractors, Sir so Robert McAlpine, they do roads, but they're really terrible at architecture or small installations. So we kind of had to fire them halfway through. And, um, but in a way, they, they, were, they were right. Uh, some of the things that we're suggesting didn't work. Uh, we were like three years from, from uni and we were sort of quite naive about uh, our engineering skills were not that well developed, but this was the idea. But you know, uh, also the idea had some something to do with um, uh, sort of enjoyment uh, and say, making it into a playscape in itself. And then the idea of having sort of this grid that's been jumbled, you know, where you start to sort of find spaces within it that you you actually start to occupy. And these are the, the discussions that we had with, with the contractor uh, week after week, and them saying, no, go away. Uh, <laughs> not, not afraid to iterate too yeah. much. Yeah, and then at the end, we, we sort of uh, compromised uh, between a, a hybrid solution. Uh, again, with our agenda of reducing the amount of material that we're going to have to sort of get rid of. Uh, so, yeah. So we built this thing. Uh, it was uh, essentially a pavilion for celebrating the big, you know, the this uh, the extension of a new wing to the Leeds Art Gallery. It was an event that ran for three weeks. Around five thousand people came along. And we had a, a really amazing time, and you know. The, the sort of variety of spaces uh, were then kind of used quite well. And in a way, we, in, uh, we succeeded in sort of kind of making it so cheap that actually they had lots of money for, for programs, uh, which we're quite proud of. Uh, this is some of the programs. Uh, we had the cinema. That's me there trying to do some drawing. Uh, we had the local grime group uh, performing there, uh, more of the arts programs, sort of more of the kind of children's play area. Uh, and everything had to be read so that, because we had, we had so many stakeholders, everyone saying, oh, we, we want this, oh, we want this. We just ended up saying, you can have it as long as it's read. Uh, and again, that's our idea of like, if you're gonna have a chip building, a, a similar color hides the sort of fault, faultiness of junctions. And then we, we, we drew the, the, the sort of aftermath and we had a sort of like discussion about, you know, how people again interact with objects. It's because of kind of one of our obsessions. And again, I think also it's, you know, the idea of like, you know, that the in between spaces, I think also all of, the, all of those things were kind of layered in this project. Yeah, the, one of the nice things about this project was that it was a, a competition win, but we got to work with uh, lots of really interesting collaborators. Uh, we have one of our favorite collaborators here today at the back. Hello. Hey, um, but it, it's, it's something that we've become very interested in. 
because we want to scale our ideas. You know, our projects are getting bigger, and if we're working with people, we're going to have loads of opportunities to do amazing stuff. So this is a particular team we worked on, which was very interesting, with engineers, poets, graphic designers, landscape, um, the, the works, right? Um, this was for a public space next to the Tower Bridge in London, and we were shortlisted on this project from 60 entries down to the last four or five. Something like that. I didn't turn up to the interview. That's why we lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah, yeah we, we forgot to go to the to go the crit, basically. Yeah. Um, a bit more professional, but. <laughs> yeah, we were, and this was a disused. Ad, you can't kind of, can't believe, but on the the riverfront of London, so close to the so close to the Tower Bridge, there was actually a fairly underused water waterfront jetty. And we then imagined it, reimagined it, because the commercial uses had kind of gone. And this is where the design museum used to be, if anyone remembered the old design museum. The kind of commercial uses and the, and the attraction of that site is gone. So we're imagining kind of a public park and, used, and finding some kind of modular uh, landscape elements, planting, floor markings, wayfinding, sculptures to kind of slow the whole space down, give it a bit of identity, and also to kind of provide a new green space for the local residents, because they don't have green space there. You can see that there's kind of pockets of space, uh, and it's kind of, a, kind of a cool place to hang out, using all kind of recycled materials, etc. Another recent uh, project we've, we've just done was and again, a big collaboration, but across four time zones. So trying to arrange meetings between Hong Kong, uh, Massachusetts, the UK, and Venice. The project was kind of a reworking of an existing bus station and a large building associated with that bus station. And working in a bigger team, you know, suddenly the kind of the, the comics and the, the idea of being clear with what you're presenting or trying to trying to work with other people became really important, especially when people, you know, we have meetings early in the morning, but everyone there is tired because it's late at night. Yeah, Hong Kong. <laughs> just, I'm just gonna flick through these a little bit quickly. Um, yeah, this is the existing building, kind of a sort of postmodernist slash brutalist concrete bus station. But we took some of the elements, like this arched central space and kind of, um, use that as a visual reference to, to uh, add an additional story and, and kind of open up the transparency of the building a bit. The, the bus station in that city was, was being moved. They were building a new um, environmentally friendly electric bus station, basically, weren't they, Bo? Yep. And they were promoting cycling. But this building also had a dance school, and then the, the idea was that the dance school was going to be used as a uh, a catalyst for some regeneration. Suppose that can be all in Italy, where you can have a dance school on top of a bus station. <laughs> yeah, so we, 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 our notion of performance actually drove the design quite a lot. So we, we transfer, transformed some of the, the old office spaces for the, for the bus company into a two, sort of 200 seat dance theater. We also included studios, practice rooms, and then restaurants and some, also some other community spaces. For the landscape, we kind of re-greened what was kind of pretty raw, rough landscape and put in some external uh, piazza-type seating with sort of mini amphitheaters where they could have outdoor performances. And we also thought of um, having f flexible use canopy, which could uh, provide sort of what we, call, we, we thought of as like the theatre of everyday life, a marketplace. Here's some of that drawings. That's the 200 seat theatre in the refurbished building. Okay. I think this is the sort of last one. Um, this is also kind of uh, to do with uh, and, 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 you know, finding gaps in spaces and sort of jumbling things. But in a way, we came with this one uh, in a way about sort of undoing something 
and sort of recombining it in sort of a different way. Uh, this is an article that maybe explained it better. I'm not going to read it. Uh, we're fascinated by this sort of, um, what's it called again? This is what's our favorite book, this, this one, first of all. Um, there's a process called, called nulling, which is really, you know, if, you, if you're going on a, travel, a trip, you can take your bag out and like empty all the things. We, we like, yeah. Yeah, this is a nolly of, kind of things sort of being taken apart. Reorganizing something, but it doesn't quite make sense in the same way anymore. Yeah. Kind of. Also just beautiful images. Uh, this is a project, sort of another competition that we won, but we actually never took it forward. Um, this is a, a house that essentially was doing away with the idea of walls, uh, sort of formal ideas of walls, but actually making things into sort of sculptural forms that are then placed uh, in the sort of kind of knolling style. Uh, this was a, a competition in Ghana, and they used a lot of mud. And then we, we, we were looking at sort of uh, things in, in Mali, and um, those the, the dog on, uh, they're also in, in Mali. And, and sort of juxtaposition between the settlements in, in, uh, in mud in, in North Africa and uh, the, the Palladian villa how that composition, in a way, is sort of well composed and is brought in together, whereas that one is sort of kind of placed, and some of the placing is quite nominal. We don't quite know what the logic is, but in a way, it, you know, we're fascinated by the idea. We like them both, but this one better. Yeah. yeah. So we had made drawings, uh, we made some sculptures, all of those. And then we took this into the sort of bigger scale. We thought actually maybe we could make a city of these things. Um, and then we, uh, I think last year we, we got this image into uh, the uh, summer exhibition. Um, yeah, but essentially kind of here is what it is. <laughs> yeah, this is a research, one of our research projects. We don't know what to do with it. Maybe it become a park or something soon. Yeah. Another competition entry at some point. Some more of the details of these characterful. And yeah, from this project, which is doing this unpicking thing and breaking apart spaces, we're also going to show a project, a real project for um, a, a big house that we've worked on, on a kind of big empty site with ghostly trees and that's the client. That's the client. He's kind of a wacky artist, wasn't he? Yeah. Vaughn. Um, but we had to have bringing together different concepts of us that you know we've been building up, referencing here farmhouses and courtyards. So we're interested in courtyards, but that also relates to some of our work where we're doing these different uh, logic of forms. Some of Bo's really early sketches of sort of a landscape with maybe furniture just turning up inside it, and the voids cut into. Uh, kind of a raw nature. In the, on near the site in Cambridgeshire, there's these chalk pits, and that, that's kind of a, a big driver of the local economy. And you can actually see them as you drive through the, the villages. And we kind of really like the idea of carving and geology. So we were looking at references where houses would be a bit more hidden because they're digging into the ground, or they would reduce their environmental impact because they don't need to build so much um, external envelopes. So they can't lose heat because they're nestled into the ground. We found a lot of really exciting examples of that type of architecture, including you know, Peter Zemthor, Hazak de Maron, uh, Japanese stuff. Us playing with the concept. There was another concept about trees, referencing these um, and how you don't quite see things through the trees. We wanted to minimize the appearance of our, this house in the countryside because we want the countryside to uh, talk for itself and not be spoiled by uh, some kind of mansion. A lot of sketches, models, everything. We try and photograph all our stuff because if you do that one sketch or that one model, you don't photograph it, then you've lost the record forever. Yeah, you can see some of these, how you might start inhabiting 
a, a model which is half about digging, half about trees, or like these tree-like forest of columns. This is the real proposal, which went in for planning. And private spaces like bedrooms and bathrooms are kind of contained within these little miniature farmhouses. And then there's planted courtyards of, sort of different types of flowers or vegetables that relate to uh, the different rooms. So, you know, for example, that your bathroom maybe, well, we like the idea that you might have lavender smell outside your bathroom, so you might have a lavender courtyard or Next to the kitchen, you might have a courtyard which has uh, your herbs and vegetables and all the kind of spaces which are shared, like living rooms and kitchens, are all kind of, kind of open space. That's the building, which is it's not very high, is it? It was something like, off the top of my head, I can't remember, but it was something like 1.8 meters tall from the outside yeah. because the building cuts into the ground to, you know, to achieve that extra height, which means it's a more, mo when you look at it from outside, it's a more modest uh, structure, but we also enjoyed the, having different, lots of different levels, kind of for architectural interest. These are all the cross sections. It's a big model, took, a f took me a few days to build. Yeah, a A0, A0 foam board model. Not expensive to make, but just, you know, just, nice and big so you can really feel like you're in the spaces. Some kind of concept images where we, you know, turn the opacity down on the SketchUp so you can just see the background. Imagining the thing in different uh, seasons. This was a Christmas card that we gave to the client. Yeah, we, um, we did this render just as a Christmas card, didn't we? He was sort that of one, one unconvinced about the project. So he saw this and then I said, yeah, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, kind of some of the materiality of the thing. And then we did the, we did what our favorite thing is trying to reimagine the project and the concept in, this, in an image. So we're talking about trees and nature, essentially, and how you'll be closer to it and feel connected to it. So that, that's what this uh, A1 drawing, A1 hand drawing did. And the fun thing about this drawing is that we kept swapping sides. So I, I was sitting at the bottom end with my pen drawing it that way, doing some plants and maybe some people. And then uh, Wangani would sit at the top end, drawing some plants, and then we had to swap every so often so that you, the styles that we draw in match, so you can't really see who's done what. There's some of the kind of detail of it. So we've got to, we've got to apologize because we've gone over by some time, a little bit. It's now, what, 10 past seven? So that, as our apology, we've got the audience giveaway. And up for grabs is a copy of Once Upon a China. It's my new book. And um, I've written this book with CJ Lim, who teaches at the Bartlett. Um, it's, it relates a little bit to our work in terms of it's all about comics. It's got lots of kind of cool comic drawings, you know? So the, it works like this. It's been a long presentation. Which Anyone? project had a giraffe? Yeah? Yes. Police box. Well oh, done. I like this new kind of quiz for you. <laughs> um, sign? <laughs> yeah, go on. What's the name, mate? It's uh, for Oscar. <laughs> for Oscar. That's you, right? Or someone yeah, else? Oh, no, it's Ben. There you go. This is Dan. <laughs> you guys actually follow me on Instagram. Oh, yeah? Do you? Yeah, I've been following you. Like, uh, what's your, oh, what's your sure. Instagram? <laughs> it's, uh, it's like Oscar, Oscar, but with a P in it. Okay, so Oscar A O S C A R. A O, yeah. I've been following for ages, and uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's good. Are you a student here? Yeah, yeah I am. Second year masters. Okay, cool. How second? Year?
Yeah. All right, yeah. <laughs> we don't have any more prices. <laughs> I, I double in drawing. He's, he's got the hand. So he's been teaching me how to draw essentially for the past 15 years. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't know. I think it's just become like a, a practice standard. I suppose you, you get to sort of want, you know, those old school practices where they teach you how to draw in a particular way. I think maybe that's kind of what we're sort of settling into. I, I, I sort of agree. I don't 100% agree. Like, I always enjoyed when we'd, we uh, discussed and draw everything together during the projects. Yeah. Um, but I'd say same with like, the, the project for the mud city, these, all the mud models. We don't know who made them. Which ones do we now? No. There's hundreds of them. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, do, I do sometimes grab the... You know, I, there's a lot of fun bits. Sometimes you get to draw like a little kid, like playing with a, a toy or something. I'm like, oh, can I draw that? And I often let Bo do the hard bits. <laughs> Bo, Bo always writes the project text. Yeah. And then, and then I edit it. That's an interesting working thing. Yeah. Right. Same here. Thank you, guys. It's a really, really excellent example of a strategic, uh, and I guess to a certain extent risk-free, approach to situate your own practice. And I say risk-free because I think I think you said that you were both at the same time of you know trying to position yourselves, you were both working for other practices. I don't yeah. know if you still are. Um, but the question was really about experimentation in that context and jumping from your work in your kind of stable daytime private practice yeah. uh, to this very experimental world where the way you think has to be, I imagine, quite different. So going from a highly regulated environment to one, a space where you can really experiment. Uh, so the question really has two parts. One is, what, what is that like? Uh, and did one inform the other in a really conscious way? Well, uh, um, I, well, maybe, maybe I'll start with sort of working in practice. Uh, I think maybe kind of like, oh, starting your own practice is sort of often sort of glorified. The, the actual reality of it is quite difficult. So I think us trying to form a practice was going, only to, uh, was going to happen only if we sort of uh, make time for it and sort of uh, make time for it in a way that actually uh, we were not sort of kind of pulling our hair and saying, oh, we can't pay our, you know, you know, our, our workers and all that kind of stuff. We can sort of start somewhere uh, with our day jobs, but at the, at the same time, we can start sort of continue the experimentation from, from uni. Um, in a way, it, it gives you an opportunity to sort of continue the things that you enjoyed. Uh, and then maybe at some point, those things um, become real. Uh, I think we, we we're never thinking that success will be around the corner uh, uh, in, in a way that we, we are practicing. Uh, so in some way, uh, if you wanted to, to do it like us, you probably, I would say, you know, start early, start sort of sketching, start entering competitions, do tiny projects, and in a way, those sort of form a tree uh, and then you start talking to people, uh, more people, and, and in a way it kind of then follows up. But at the same time, um, we've worked in practice for like nearly 10 years, and that's really important because then you understand how practices run and also sort of the day-to-day -day stresses of it and how in a way you're looking up at sort of seeing where you could, in a way, if it's you, where you could take away some of that sort of pressure. Well, I always, um, I always think of it like, um, 
for any, for any uh, people that are maybe finishing part two or but if you're finishing part one, I reckon just get a cool practice that you think is exciting and just work there and meet, meet exciting people and have fun. If you're at part two, I think a really interesting thing to do is it's a bit like uh, looking after your, the well-being of your career is if you pick a, a really robust practice where you have to like eat a lot of architecture vegetables, yeah, you know, and do your architecture exercise, it, it really gonna be super healthy for the career, and, and we both definitely found that. You, you know, there's so many advantages of um, working for a practice who have seen things and done things before. They know they know all the problems you're gonna f fall into. They might have super interesting people working there, you know, that have devoted their life to that practice or whatever it is. And that's, it can't, I, I wish, I'm really happy that we didn't throw that away at the beginning because we were like desperate to do our own thing. We found the, the, a mix. So you do a bit of your own thing and then you're just learning absolutely loads from these great, like especially London practices are very good for it. There's some really great London practices. You can just learn absolutely loads. Yeah. But, you know, because we start a little bit early, a few benches here, a few competitions here, we also know what our architecture is going to be about as we start to scale up. So, you know, we don't find it like, oh my God, like, I've started a practice, I have to feed, you know, my kids or whatever, and, I and I'm just going to take the job and just finish it and just do whatever. But we actually, we, can, we actually know what our architecture is. We can reach our kind of our aims and agendas by yeah. kind of having a, a kind of a, what do you call it, a repertoire, I guess, yeah. from before. It's like, it's, we call it like, it's like a soft landing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good question. I kind of got kicked out of one studio for doing yeah, that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have more technical question. I really yeah. like your drawing, especially the last one with the shadows. And the, what markers do you use? <laughs> what markers do you use? Markers. I think it's markers. In which drawing? In, in this one? Yeah. This photo show, huh? Th this drawing <laughs> is... Um, it's a, like a process to make it. So we actually, because we're cheap, as Bo said, no, no, we, 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 we actually use quite a lot, very easy CAD software. We use SketchUp for a lot of our 3D. We can use Cinema 4D and Revit and all the rest, but because we're doing it sometimes it's in our own time, it's more enjoyable to use SketchUp. So we use those as like a, a basis for drawings. We then print it out and then we just we draw by hand with pen. The color on there is, uh, is actually Photoshop. But the, what we don't do in Photoshop, and I know, I know it's something that some of my uh, I don't know, colleagues at the at architecture school were doing at the time, and I always thought it was, it was a bit cheating. We don't copy things around the drawing in, by hand, or we try not to. So all the leaves are drawn one by one. So this drawing is finished as a hand drawing and then it's just coloured. It's not like we're copying around hundreds of... And that, that allows us to give it... You can tell when you put the love into the drawing. But yeah. And then, yeah, cheating with Photoshop. But we try and actually minimise the number of colours we use and leave lots of the drawing either blank, black or white.
Okay.